I'm going to start with the presentation that I intended, and then we'll have conversation afterwards. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask Alan to put everybody on mute so that we don't have background noise. Um, and I'm going to see if I... Alan gave me a tutorial on this a minute ago. And so I am going to try to uh, do that. Let's see. And that should do it. Alan, why isn't it sharing? Uh, it's on this screen. Is, is that up now? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So the, the, the title of this presentation is The Interpretive Experiential Shabbat Minion. And the reason I had this conversation before we started, and I, and I appreciate all of you who participated in the conversation, is because I needed to get some kind of a context. Because the genesis of this is about eight or nine years ago when I uh, went to my rabbi with the idea of allowing me to do a, uh, a, um, an alternative minion to attract people to Shabbat that haven't ordinarily been going to Shabbat morning services. And I got a lot of resistance for it and, um, uh, and it took me several years to get traction. And then after about three or four years, uh, I gained acceptance in the synagogue. Bob Breitman and I authored a book about this uh, called Creating a Shabbat uh, Community. And um, after doing that, we, uh, in my synagogue, we, we, again, gained acceptance by the rabbi, the board of directors. We started appearing in our synagogue bulletin. And for six or seven years now, we have been maintaining a minion of 15 to 20 people every Shabbat morning in the alternative service. The interesting thing that happened to me three weeks ago when we went into isolation and quarantine is uh, the rabbi was developing the idea of doing Zoom, maybe it was four weeks ago now, of doing Zoom services. And I asked for permission to create an, another Zoom meeting to do the alternative minion. And his response was the same that I got nine years ago. It's important to, com to keep the community together. And maybe you want to rethink having an alternative minion in these times. So being the uh, cooperative player that I normally am, I said, I will give it a week and we'll see what happens. And so we had the services that following Shabbat and we got our normal 35 to 40 people on Saturday morning. We had a lot on Friday night. We had about 70 or 80 people when normally we get 20 or 30. But we attracted on Friday night, but on Saturday morning, he had his regular 35 or maybe 40 people on Shabbat morning. And so I went to him and I said, are you ready? And he said, sure, go ahead and have your alternative. And I had 20 people that, that, Shabbat, that next Shabbat morning. And for the next two weeks, I've averaged 15 to 20 people. And then we didn't have it last week because it was my men's club Shabbat, but I intend to bring it again next Shabbat. And it proved to me uh, that even by de delivering the same service via Zoom, via live streaming, uh, in this time of wanting community, needing community, there's still a call to develop a creative alternative for those people like me who really don't want to sit in front of a TV screen for three and a half hours and be entertained by the Chazan. And, and I love services. Those of you that know me know I'm a traditionalist. I daven. I'm a shaliach tzibor. I love going to services, but I can't be entertained. I have to participate. And I'm finding that a Zoom service is not doing it for me. And so I feel that uh, having this alternative is still a viable concept. And that's why I asked Alan Cahan and Alan Budman to allow me to make this presentation because I still think that it's worthwhile. Park Synagogue notwithstanding, or Temple Emmanuel who can attract 400 people on Zoom, but I don't understand how they get 200 people to a regular Shabbat service. 
my synagogue gets 25 to 30. So going back to the genesis of this whole idea of creating an alternative community, um, I was inspired by an exec board meeting of the FJMC where Arnie Eisen, who was then the chancellor of the seminary, made a presentation about the future of conservative Judaism. And he talked about attendance at synagogue. And there was one sentence that stood out to me. And the sentence was that among affiliated conservative Masorti Jews in the United States, we average, now again, Park Synagogue is an anomaly, we average three to 4% having a regular Shabbat prayer experience. And that includes Friday night and Saturday morning. And that was measured on one attendance a month. So that was really striking to me because I feel very strongly about Shabbat, that that is one of our core principles in Judaism. There's Shabbat and there's Kashrut and to me, everything else is commentary, like Hillel would say. It's about loving your neighbor, and everything else is commentary. Well, for Jewish practice, I believe that it's Shabbat, however you practice it. I don't define Shomer Shabbat. However you practice Shabbat, I think it's a Shabbat experience, and it's Kashrut, however you observe Kashrut, whether it's only in your head, or it's whether with two sets of dishes and only textured meat, however you do it. I believe that those are the core practices of Judaism as far as the rules are concerned. So I wanted to develop a way for people to uh, have a better Shabbat experience. So again, so the challenge that we're facing in conservative Masorti Judaism here in North America is that we are not having a community Shabbat experience on a regular basis, no matter how you define it. Maybe with this Zoom experience, we are attracting more people to Shabbat because they're finding a need to sign on on Friday night, or they're finding a need to connect on Shabbat morning. And that's a wonderful thing. But it would take a lot to convince me that when this whole pandemic is over, and I don't know when that will be, and we can get back to our synagogue buildings, will we be averaging more than three or four percent of our membership having a community Shabbat experience other than maybe a meal on Friday night? So we designed, I designed with Bob Braitman and Rabbi Simon at the time, this idea of an interpretive minion. I didn't like the the name alternative minion, it seems that that's now the colloquial term of choice, but I'm still calling it an interpretive minion. Um, and it was designed for adults. Uh, once in a while we get a teen or a collegian uh, to attend, but it's basically designed for adults. It's, it's designed to be welcoming, open, inviting, uh, non-judgmental. It's designed to parallel the traditional service in the building. Uh, it's not intended to be a substitute service. It's intended to offer an alternative. It's intended to attract people who either want to change for a week or want to experience Shabbat in a way that they can and find meaningful where they don't find that ability and meaning in attending the traditional service. And it's particularly not a learner's service. Although there may be some learning during the service, it's not designed to be a class where people graduate and then proceed to the traditional service. That is not what it's intended to be. And I'm proud to say that in my interpretive minion, uh, there are people that come that have been coming to that service now for six, seven, eight years. Um, and continue to experience Shabbat and continue to learn. So it is not intended to be a class where uh, they're expected to graduate out into the traditional service. 
the setting of the service is um, it was more radical six, seven years ago when I conceived of this than it is now because I know many of our synagogues are in transformation and that's a good thing. And I don't know if they've been influenced by what's been going on in various alternative minyanim around the country or whether they're just responding to the times. But when you hear the general setting, you'll see how some of these influences have permeated into the traditional service. It's a comfortable environment. It's to be a meaningful shared experience. It's to encourage attendance uh, by people who are willing to extend their comfort zones. We give roles to people who aren't necessarily highly educated in the skills of participating in a Shabbat service. And yet we encourage them to take on roles, whether in Hebrew or in English, to, to participate more than just by listening, but by speaking, by um, uh, offering a question or offering an answer or offering an opinion, uh, doing a reading. Uh, I run it, this is very timely. I, I run the alternative minion that I facilitate and excuse me if I call it my minion, it's not my minion. Uh, Jerry and Diane, you'll excuse me for saying my minion, but it's the minion that I often facilitate, but Jerry Sakel has facilitated at times. Jerry, uh, Eric Yegelwell, for those of you who know him, have facilitated the minion at times. Uh, so uh, we, that's also extending people's comfort zones because some of the people that have facilitated the service were not experienced or comfortable in facilitating a service. And yet by encouragement of the community, they've been able to do that. Uh, I, run, I, I run it like a Passover Seder, how timely that is. And by that, I mean that we have our service, but if anybody has a question or a comment during the service, we stop and we have a conversation and then we resume our service. And if we don't finish, we know we're going to be meeting again next week. We're not, we try not to be controlled by the clock and we try not to be controlled by what page we're on. So if somebody has a question or if somebody has a comment or a thought or whatever they want to share, we'll stop the service and we'll allow that to happen and welcome it. Uh, everything we do is in Hebrew and in English so that whatever the skill level of the people that are attending, they're able to feel comfortable and not feel that they're in a foreign place and not be comfortable participating. And we don't experiment much, much with new melodies, although we have been lately, uh, much due to David Singer's influence on the meditative service. We have been bringing some chanting into our service. And I find that the people are comfortable learning those new, new chants because they're simple and they're fewer in words than the melodies that we usually do, and people are comfortable doing that. Uh, so we try to set a, a, a ambiance that's comfortable to the people coming. Who are we trying to attract? Well, because we want to share community on Shabbat morning, we try to attract a broad range of adults willing to participate. We don't care if they're literate in Hebrew. We do as much in English as we do in Hebrew. And the Hebrew that we do is very repetitive. And um, if they've attended services elsewhere, most of it is the substance that we know by rote, whether we know how to read Hebrew or not. Um, and we try to attract people that wanna have a Shabbat prayer experience in a setting that's comfortable to them. And we also try to attract people who are willing to participate in a level that's going to increase their understanding of Shabbat, whether prayer, Torah, um, practice, custom, tradition, because we share all of that. And so we try to attract people who want to participate and increase their knowledge. Again, the setting is we try to present as non-threatening, 
there's no dress code. There's, uh, we always start with um, initial introductions, like I did this afternoon, to make people comfortable, to, to have people kind of know who is on the call or who's at the service. And we spend five or 10 minutes before the service just schmoozing. What's new? What's new with the family? How's your daughter? I know she's seven months pregnant. How's she doing? Those kinds of things. And it relaxes people. It makes everybody feel welcome, feel comfortable. It allows us to get to know each other a little bit better, which in these times has become very helpful because now when we get on Zoom with the alternative minion, everybody knows everybody else. Um, so, so that's helped a lot. And we try to celebrate and share different events from the, for the people that are attending as a community. Um, so that's the environment that we try to create. Our prayer service um, is not very complicated. It's a bullet point service. I can share that outline with you and, and I'll show you where you can get the outline for the service. Um, it is a halachically a complete uh, bezuke to Zimra and Shachrit service, but it is very much abbreviated. It takes us about 30 to 35 minutes with some chanting and some singing to get through the entire uh, outline, and that's in Hebrew and in English. So you can tell that it's a very abbreviated service, but again, it's halachically correct. Uh, I've, I've vetted it through several different rabbis, and, and they've all agreed that the, the, if I were to ask any one of you, well, is, you know, what would you expect to be in a halakhically correct minion? I'm very confident that what you suggest, I would be able to respond, yes, that's in the outline, and that's there. Um, we create a situation so that everybody takes a part to lead, either pre-assigned or as we go along, they're called on to do a Hebrew or an English reading. And because I try to get comfortable with everybody's skill level, I'll call on the people that I know can do the Hebrew reading in Hebrew, and I'll call on the people that are only comfortable doing English to read in English. And it works out very well. Um, and then again, I'll give it occasional explanations uh, if we come across something new. Switching from Sim Shalom to Lev Shalom, that's given the opportunity to give some more explanations because questions always arise. How come the English is different if the Hebrew didn't change? Or why is the emphasis on this psalm instead of this psalm? And so it just gives the opportunity to give some explanation. And so I try to do that to make it a little bit more interesting and not as rote. If you break up the service a little bit, uh, it tends not to be as robotic. I've tried to get rabbis from the Bema to do this for decades now, and I'm not successful in doing that. The closest I can get is, okay, now it's gather, time to gather the CC. I can't get them as a, as a group to stop and give an explanation of what we're doing uh, because it affects the time. We have to be in Kiddush by 1210. So it doesn't work. And it's been a, a bone of contention for me for a long time, but um, I haven't been successful in the main synagogue in the main service in getting this done. Um, so an example of a lesson that we might do in a service is that we might, before getting to the Birkot Shachar, we may talk about uh, connecting to the service, connecting to God, what it means to be created a uh, Salem uh, Elohim in the, in the image of God. And we'll talk about what prayer is about, what it means, lehit palel, what it means to have this reflective verb define what we're doing during services. And we'll spend some time talking about it. And then I'll just skip a couple more parts of the service to make sure that we get through what we want to get through that morning. So that's an example of what we might do during a, uh, a, a, an interpretive minion. The most stimulating part for me has been the Torah discussion. After we're done with the Bezuke de Zimmer and the Shachri, we go into a Torah discussion. We have no Torah scroll. We're not in a sanctuary. We're sitting around a round table 
we have coffee makers going. Most of the people have a cup of coffee in front of them. And we discuss Torah. The fascinating part of this for me has been that over the years, the people that participate, who again, are not your, 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 your chacham of the synagogue. They're not your wise men. They are wise, but not scholarly in Torah. And yet they read the Torah portion before they come to synagogue every week. It's mind blowing. If I don't get my email out by Thursday, I'm getting emails back. What's the Torah portion this week? Because they want to read the Torah portion before they get there. I challenge the rabbis to ask their congregants how many people have read the Torah portion before they come to services for the Torah reading on Shabbat morning. I don't think they would get very many hands to go up. So this to me has been an incredible transformative experience for me to stimulate lay people to read Torah during the week so they're prepared to discuss that on Shabbat morning. And that's what we do. And then we have a, a, a Torah discussion. Again, we don't have the pomp and ceremony. So we read the bracha, la asot b'divrei Torah, before the Torah discussion. And if we have a minion, which we thank God normally do, we do the Kaddish de Rabbanon after the Torah discussion. That satisfies the need of the people who are saying Kaddish. And that satisfies my need to have a bookend at the end of uh, the Torah discussion because we did the bracha before. Just like when you have a meal, you do the motzi, and then you do the birkat amazon. You do the la sot b'divrei Torah, and you do the Kaddish de Rabbanon. And it makes a very nice setting. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to say that as a result of what we do at the Alternative Minion, the rabbi has now taken on that tradition during these times of Zoom services where we don't have the pop and ceremony of Torah to do the bracha and the Kaddish de Rabbanon when we study Torah during our minions now. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we had that impact. Um, so after we're done with the Torah discussion, uh, typically in my synagogue, if there's not a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, our rabbi has been persuaded to save his comments for the end of the service so we can join for his Torah remarks. So we will not do the conclusion of the service in our alternative minion. We'll go upstairs usually to catch Musaf and the rabbi's comments and then the concluding prayers, Ain Kelohenu, Alenu, Adon Olam, the mourner's Kaddish, and that's typically how we'll end. When there's a week where there's a bar bat mitzvah, we will stay in our alternative minion and we will conclude the service down. I say downstairs because that's where it is, but in, in the alternative minion. And that's how we conclude. So that's really the presentation that I wanted to make. Um, if anybody is interested in pursuing this, there is a book that I, I'll do some... Uh, shameless promotion for Bob and for me, even though we don't get any remuneration for this, but our book is available at Amazon. All you have to do is go to amazon.com books and put in Building Shabbat Community or, uh, um, and, and our book will come up. The price has come down. It started at $12.95. I believe the last time I checked, it's $8.95. Uh, but you can pick up, and I saw there were some used books on available. I don't know what they look like or where they come from. But the book is available, and the outline for the service, and more particulars about it is in there. And in the beginning of the book, I'll give some promotion to Bob, who's on the call. Bob did a beautiful uh, portion of the book on running um, uh, Learner's Minions, which is a counterpart to this. And, and it's a six week or a five or six week presentation on teaching a learner's minion, uh, which is very nice. And there's an introduction by Arnie Eisen and you might um, be interested in uh, acquiring that book if you're interested in doing this. So I'm gonna stop sharing if I know how to do that.
and go back to my screen. And I'm going to ask Alan, or you can just unmute yourself if you have a question. Raise your hand. I'll call on you if I see you. If I don't see you, just jump in. I think I have everybody on my screen. And I'd like to hear your comments and uh, questions. And thank you, Alan, for the technological assistance. It worked very well. Anybody? Yeah, I, I asked about the the uh, Torah portion. I mean, are your shows following the triennial or the the complete triennial? Show? Triennial. So you, but when you prepare your Torah discussions, it's it's on the entire portion. Absolutely. So it's not you're not following the triennial. You just do the portion for the week, and That's okay, right. discuss it from there. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So I, I, I commented my questions. Um, that's like what we do at FJMC. We do an alternative minion, people break out and they go in and do that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's only like recently, it, recently, it's only since the last maybe three or four conventions that we do that. Uh, yeah. Because in years past, we got pushback on that until, like we, until we formed something meaningful. And then we broke out, and yes, and now we do even more breakout. Now David Singer's doing a meditative well, minion. So and we'll do a learner's I, minion. Yeah, Go ahead. I like it. I like the alternative. My my question was with all the people doing Zoom minions, how many different prayer books are they? We have three people. Use, you know, we have three prayer books at our Zoom minion. How are you guys keeping track? I made a list. Are you having that issue too with the Zoom minion? Different, you know, Lave Shalom, Sim Shalom, Sim Shalom for Shabbat, Art Scroll. Well, we're trying to use what the RA has sent out to our community. So they, for Shabbos, they use Lev Shalem and Pages. And yeah, we have weekend, that too. But people don't have, oh, they download them before. Got it. What my, yeah. what my synagogue did, John, when, when this whole thing was starting, they had some foresight. And we were able to go to the synagogue building. And there was one person, you, you made a reservation. You came and picked books. up a book and a chumash. That's you can great. Pick up three, three books per household: the daily minion, the Shabbat minion, Sim Shalom, that's great, and, and festivals and the Chumash. And yep. so many of our households that are participating, and again, not all 500 are participating. No, of course, I understand. But the 60, 70, 80 families, they right. all have the book that we're using. Got it. Okay. Yeah, we didn't get that. Everyone's got to do what they do, but we, we worked it out with the... And also the Rabbinic Assembly has online a free download. And I print it out. Guys, people are using that too. So. Yeah, but they forgot to put Bazooka to Zimra on there, so... I, I know. So, <laughs> so but everyone has that. a copy of... We all have the Sim Shalom at home. Right. Yeah. Our yeah. New Hampshire was doing the same thing with uh, having uh, books available to, to pick up. Um, you know, I, I think I just wanted to underline, uh, first of all, thanks, Noam. This was great. Um, You're welcome. My memory about all this. and uh, But, you know, there, there was a, uh, the concern was, and Norm mentioned this, that, well, this would just take away from the main service. But the people who, what the goal was here was to, to enhance our community on Shabbat by people who aren't going to walk in the door because the main service just didn't speak to them. Um, and... Uh, so here is a group of people for whom uh, all of a sudden this alternative minion that you're doing, Norman, is speaking to them in a way that, in words that they're not hearing in the sanctuary. Um, and it's not to put down the sanctuary, it just wasn't, it wasn't uh, meaningful for them in a way that prompted them to come. And so this is, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful venue. And uh, I love the, uh, the schmoozing in the beginning. Uh, I think that's a, it's, a, it's really, it's a nice touch. And, um, you know, you saw it even on this call for everybody who was here, you know, a minute or two earlier, you know, we started to schmooze a little and everybody was introduced. And uh, it's a skill that uh, I'm gonna copy. So it takes two things. It takes persistence because when you try to introduce this in, in your congregation, unless you have an extremely unique rabbi, you're probably going to get some resistance because the immediate response is, our service is great. We just don't understand why people aren't coming. But you know, you know, you're going to get that. And then the second challenge, which I know I face, is I enjoy going to the traditional service. But 
you, you, you get the reward by, like Bob said, offering something to people that won't come unless you offer this. So it takes persistence and then it takes commitment because originally I was doing once every three weeks, uh, then once every two weeks. And I found it really didn't get traction. I think Jerry will agree with me on this, Jerry Sakel. It didn't really get traction until we started doing it every week because then it became a true community on Shabbat. And people knew that if they came, there was gonna be an alternative minion and they would come. And the, the, the proof is in the pudding to me that we have these Zoom calls now and I can see who's there. It's like, you can take attendance, you can pull up that participant sheet. And, and of the 15 to 20, I'm gonna say regulars to the alternative minion, 10 of them aren't showing up on Zoom, are not showing up on Zoom. And that hurts me because that means they are not having a Shabbat prayer experience unless they're finding some other synagogue. And I know that they're not because I've talked to them. Okay. But this is also an opportunity to find alternatives outside of your geographical community because, wow, they're all on internet now. And if you just Google a synagogue, you're going to find a live stream somewhere. And it's really kind of cool. Um, but it, it, it's not easy. Um, and I'm willing to work with you. If any of you want to do this in your synagogues and you're having that resistance, call me and I'll try to strategize with you. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll try to help you break through that. And if you just pay my transportation, I'm not looking for anything. Once we can start flying again, I will come out and help facilitate because I'm very committed to these alternative minyanim. And, and I'd really like to see these go. We have them going in, I think, five or six synagogues across the country that I know of. And that's about it. And that's after five years of promoting this. And I hear all kinds of reasons, all valid. And I hear all kinds of commitment that we're going to try, but without that persistence and without that willingness to buck the system, it's just not gonna happen automatically. It's just not going to. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to say, you know, I think most of the people on this um, call are from large synagogues. So I'm, I'm from a small synagogue here in New Hampshire, and I, besides the big synagogue I belong to in Boston. And so what we do uh, is that we'll have alternative um, uh, models on, from Shabbat to Shabbat. So okay. one Shabbat will be more traditional, one Shabbat will be a meditative service, one Shabbat will be, we'll have, we'll bring in a speaker and we'll have a very truncated uh, um, so that the speaker can, can speak for, you know, a guest speaker can speak for an hour or about whatever he's going to speak about. So um, are you all hearing me? Because I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so I think that's another model for the small synagogues that, you know, it's uh, maybe not necessarily to have it in a different room, but to, to sort of work together to create different different models, but in a synagogue that's, that has a, a solid minion, so to speak, on Shabbat, um, uh, having this kind of alternative is important. I would say, by the way, that these, these different models that we have in my place in New Hampshire, different people come. So, you know, there's the regulars that come to everything, and then there are the people who, uh, I did my learner service there. We had all different group of people. We for the meditative service for people that I never see any other time. Um, so I think that, uh, and and some of them is just straight toward discussion. We'll have um, uh, actually when we started with we 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 did meet in person the first week of this uh, uh, shelter in place, and you know we all sat six feet apart and. Uh, we read one, the rabbi read one Aliyah and the person who had the honor stood in, stood in his place or her place and said the bracha. But uh, there are different models. And I think that uh, sometimes uh, being creative and working together and let, and of course, the other thing is to let the community know. And that's very important is to say, we're doing something really cool here um, and, and uh, try to come in. I would just mention, you know, you asked earlier about um, these Zoom meetings. I know my sister's synagogue, the car in Los Angeles, uh, a couple of you guys are from LA. On Shabbat morning, they don't have a service on Zoom. They have their cantors doing some shtick and he's doing some singing and um, 
and people will zoom in and uh, you know you can see them chatting in the background and schmoozing and it's it's just because to sit for three hours and and watching the service and not being able to actually actively participate it's just difficult I think. Rabbi? Um, Are you going to say something? No, I'm, I'm just listening. Oh, okay. Your screen turned yellow. Oh, yeah. Okay. That signals to me that you're trying to talk. Although I would second the notion, uh, we also have a very small synagogue. We have about 100 members total and maybe uh -huh. 140 adults. So <laughs> uh, if we have 15, 20 people on a Shabbat, I guess that's better than 3%. But uh, it'd be pretty hard to split into two. Uh, especially, and my, I'm the only, uh, there's panners only for the high holidays. And uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty small gathering. And some, some of these big services that are mentioned have more serve, people in service than we have members. So it is a, it is a big difference. Uh, but you know, the, the ideas are, the question is whether to incorporate some of those ideas into, even to our regular right. service. Right. Uh, that would be the way to try to, you know, Keep it. And that's how this began. This this whole concept began by my trying to get rabbis to innovate in the traditional service. And right. when and my experience, I have five six hundred families yeah. in our in our congregation. And when I kept hitting that brick wall, I said, "All right, now I have to try to think of a different model." Yeah. And the model then became going to a different location within the same building. Yeah. And and I do this Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. I, uh, now I, I uh, we have alternative services on the high holidays, um, and and again it's attracting people that otherwise wouldn't sit for a four four and a half hour service on Yom Kippur, but they'll come for a two hour service that has English and 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 Hebrew, but all the traditions and halachically everything you would expect, but just in a different model. So, Jerry Sakel, I'm interested to hear if you have anything to add without putting you on a spot. One of the things um, I think that's really, really good about it is um, anytime during the service or discussion, you can ask a question, which is not, totally not possible during, uh, um, you know, the traditional uh, service. Um, there's no way to have a question answered, and by the end of the service, you may forget, or you'll never ask. And uh, I like to point out, I think it's already been covered, but every year, uh, Norm, um, he, he prepares, but he has a different angle. And then it's not like we talk about the same, you know, same little thing every year, but those things do come up. Like, do you remember last year when you said this? I think, um, to Norm's credit, I think that uh, he fell when he was like, Oh, getting through to people, and yeah, it's uh, he's invoking thought and um, you know more questions. So here's the secret: I'm not doing it for anybody but myself, because <laughs> I have learned so much by leading this minion. Now, I came in as a as a layman with pediatric Judaism behind me, and I had not much knowledge of Torah not much knowledge of prayer and it's amazing what you learn by teaching it's it's absolutely amazing what you learn by sharing michael freilich knows this because I, he he he's been pained to hear me in the beginning but now he's more comfortable because you learn a lot by doing this and it's just an, an amazing journey and so if you have no motivation other than to improve your own abilities Try to take on this challenge and, and, and see. I'm sure the rabbi would agree with me. Having to prepare every week challenges to learn because you because you have to have something to share and you have to have something to be able to to talk about that that that's meaningful and 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 correct to within certain parameters. And uh, so it, it's it's been a great experience. How long time does it take from start to finish? I begin at 10.30, and we're done by a quarter to 12, so an hour 15. I think a lot and I would say it's basically 45 minutes for the service and 45 minutes for the tour discussion. I think a lot of it, this is, um, I think a lot of it also depends on demographics, like where uh, 
John Brody and I go, we have, you know, a sizable congregation that comes, you know, every Shabbos, well, mostly middle to older people, but they, then we have another family service and family has kids that go to Hebrew school and they come back downstairs and it runs from like 9.30 to 11. And then we also have a teen service. So we have a bunch of different services. So there's something to appeal to everybody. And I, you know, I, I can just see the only uh, thing that people, you know, so people have other things to do. They have their kids and then all of a sudden they're out. So no matter how you change the service, I think everybody already has their service where we are. It's just a matter of the time because people, you know, people aren't going to sit to hear, you know, sit for three hours or if there's a bar mitzvah for three and a half hours. That's right. why, you know, he said, well, we're doing on Shabbos now with the Zoom um, is we do everything and we're done in an hour and a half. And I think if you did like a regular service, but to tell people, you know, listen, we're going to start at nine o'clock. You'll be done by like 11, 1130, you know, 11 o'clock or so, 1130. People would be happy with that. But when it starts to drag out and everything like that. So, but also, like I said, it's back to the demographics of each of your uh, synagogues of the kind of, of the people that you're uh, are in the community. Well, so, sure, it depends on the demographics, but, you know, I would challenge you uh, to maybe run a survey uh, and see how many people aren't coming and how many people aren't literate in Hebrew and how many people aren't comfortable. Um, I, yeah, you may not get a response to a survey, but an informal survey. Uh, you know, at a men's club meeting for the people that don't come to services regularly. Why don't you come? What do you find that's not appealing? What can we May do I, to make a service more appealing? Let me give a brief historical perspective. Akiva, Hillel, uh, some of the guys from the uh, scientific movement that started in the 1800s in Germany, uh, Solomon Schechter and Heschel all stood, and, and I guess... Uh, all, to, all had the same view that services were too darn long, dramatically so. I think that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. no, no, no doubt. If you take a look at, there's a book by uh, Max uh, Kedushin called Worship and Ethics. There's a section towards the back where he differentiates different ways of looking at services and the different groups who look at it. I think he made a comparison to uh, the four sons from the Seder from Pesachim in the Talmud. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I think that's what I remember. Jerry, you had your hand up? Yes, I would say um, now might be a great opportunity because we've seen a great expansion and people will show up. We're like, we never had a Havdalah at the show, but now we do. We have quite a number of people. Yeah. So um, every synagogue has a lot to offer. And now maybe uh, some of the parents who drop off their kids here, go to services, um, there's something for them. Like, well, if we can reach out and find these people, like here, look, there, there's something you may not know about, something you may not have experienced, but I invite um, every one of you, and we're not trying to steal your congregants, but um, they could sit on, sit in. And just understand, if you don't like one of our services, like they're, they're different every time. There's always, there's different people, different things are discussed. Um, sometimes, depending on what's happening in the world, there's a different mood and flavor about what people are. But um, maybe this coming Saturday, some of you, if you're interested, should really look in and see what, what goes on. And um, seeing that, maybe you can carve your own, your own version of it. Um, as Norman said, you know, we stay, um, stay true to the service and it's halachically um, intact, but um, to try to, you know, you can, can wing it, do, do anything you want, but we're, you're giving another service and that's what you know, the synagogue is all about, um, offering somebody something more if they don't want to sit through a three-hour liturgy. Um, yeah, come give us a try. Take a look. Well, that's interesting, Jerry. Very interesting. But I'm wondering, those parents that drop their kids off on Saturday morning and have a 
an hour, an hour and a half service or the teenagers that don't have a service during these times? Is anything being offered to them? And what else do they have to do? <laughs> you know, people are looking for stuff to do. <laughs> to do and like, hey, we got, we, got, uh, we got Hashem. So you can look at him, you know. It might be an opportunity. You know, I, I think uh, it's interesting. This, we have this great opportunity to, uh, to look into how the other half lives, so to speak, by, by looking at other stream services during the course of the, uh, you know, Shabbat, uh, particularly with different time zones. Um, and I think that's a nice uh, opportunity to sort of, you know, learn different customs. Uh, the other thing I would say, and Norm mentioned this, uh, uh, the, another aspect of this is some people will, will sit in a prayer service and, and just not find meaning in it because uh, the, the prayers just don't speak to them. And even reading the English on the other side of the page isn't, isn't enough. They sometimes need to get a context, and need to get a, um, uh, maybe a little drosh about the prayer itself. And that's where, where, I, where I, you know, I, I hate the expression learner service because, well, we're all learning, but sometimes making, taking a prayer and uh, examining it and making it uh, something that is particularly meaningful is uh, another aspect of this kind of alternative uh, experience. Um, I was, uh, had the opportunity today to study one of the Psalms that we say in Hallel and the one that starts with say Yisrael, Mi Mitzrayim. And we sing that great happy melody and I, you know, I was going through it line by line today in a, in, a, in, a, in a seminar that I was sat in on, and it just opened a whole new world for me about that psalm. I'll never say it the same way again, and I'm not going to get into it now, but it was, I think that experience also about taking it and just say, let's just stop. What happens in the, in the, in the blessing before the Shema? And, and I think, Norm, you're probably doing this in your, in your service a little bit, but um, that's why, you know, learner services, you know, it sounds like we're all talking about kindergarten and it's really role learning and just having a prayer uh, uh, explode in our mind is an experience that you just can't do if you just put your head down. And, uh, and uh, that's why it's so, I think it's so important for all of us to advocate for, for not for change necessarily, but for alternatives within our community. When so I, I ran like an experimental service uh, a number of years ago, with an assistant rabbi, we would focus on at least one prayer during each of the sessions that we ran. For We'd read it in the Hebrew, we'd do it in the English, we'd do a literal translation of the Hebrew, we did an idiomatic translation of the Hebrew, and then we discussed it and talked about it. That was very effective for learning, and for and I, I wouldn't call it a learner service, I'd call it a non-traditional service, the way we did it, like we followed Norm's outline. So um, I, I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, I, I hope you found something worthwhile to take away. If you learn one thing, that, then it was worthwhile. Um, I'm going to be having uh, the opportunity to facilitate an alternative minion this Shabbat at my synagogue. If anybody's interested in joining, send me an email and I'll send you the link. I'd be happy to do that just so you can see what it's like, just to see what we do and, and, and how we do it. Um, like Bob said, we have this opportunity now. You can visit Buffalo Grove, Illinois without coming here. And uh, we'd love to have you come here, but this is the second best. You can come by Zoom. And uh, what time does it start? It, we start well, depends who asked that question. This is Alex on the West Coast. Uh, so so yeah, Alex, it'll start at 8.30 in the morning. We're sort of at a disadvantage of, of uh, having all of these lovely East Coast services happen before the sun comes up. No, no. For you, it would be 8.30. We start at 10.30. Okay. So send me an email, and I'll send you the link. And we would love to have you join us. Um, oh, and uh, come with low expectations, and you'll be very, very pleased. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't believe him. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for joining. Thank um, you much. Uh, and uh, yeah. stay, stay safe, oh. stay healthy. Uh, give everybody that's within your walls of your home a big hug. And uh, uh, hopefully someday we'll be able to hug each other once again. Chag Sameach and have a good week, everybody. Thank you. Air hug. I'll join too. I'll send you an email.
All right, send me an email, I'll send you the link. Okay.